something's coming at us with the light behind, the shadow of it we'll see first. It'll give us the outline. We might not know all the details, but we get a chance to be able to see kind of the idea of what's coming. Now, blueprint, though, that's something different. Blueprint gives more of a plan and the structure, the details, the design. In the tabernacle, we had talked briefly, I gave quite a few plugs last week regarding the tabernacle, so this should not be a surprise to anyone that this is the subject here today. But the tabernacle is actually God's blueprint for his gospel plan. Um, I'm not going to go through and read the text because we're looking at six different chapters. On top of that, there's another five or six that, that talk about that they created it exactly the way that God had commanded them. So what we're going to do today is, is I'm going to simply walk through the tabernacle and summarize it for you. What these items are, the way that it was laid out, how that relates to us, and how we are called to use that. Um, there'll be three parts to today's, uh, today's sermon. And... Um, it has everything to do with living in the presence of God. Tabernacle is a tent, a dwelling place, a sanctuary where God met his people. And like I said, really what it all comes down to is this. God with us. Like the scriptures say, that the child will be named Emmanuel, which means God with us. That's the whole point of the Bible. That we lived in Eden, the Garden of Eden. And the tree of life was there. And that symbolized the way that we were meant to be in God's presence. We were created to lean on Him, to have Him provide for us, for a union that was there together. And in Genesis 3, the sin of eating the forbidden fruit caused separation. And really, at the end of the Bible, you see the tree of life again in Revelation 21, 22. And that also symbolizes us being back to where we were meant to be, in God's presence. The whole Bible is talking in between. is telling us what's God doing between those two places. What is he doing to bring us from back into that place? The tabernacle, we're going to see, even has things in it that tell us that it's supposed to remind us of the garden. It's supposed to remind us that it is, again, the throne room of God. Not in its fullness yet, but to a certain degree. See, sin destroyed our relationship between God and humanity. But he wants to repair things. And that's what he's trying to show us. Not only how he's doing it, but how we can come into that. But a holy God cannot live in the presence of sin without destroying it. He is a consuming fire. He is all good. Sin is rebellion against him. And he does bring judgment upon him. A refining fire. A consuming fire, we said last week. The temporal solution is the tabernacle at this point. And eventually that moves into the temple. Eventually then that moves into New Jerusalem. But really the fullness of what we see is it through Christ. And that's what we're going to walk through today. As in our, in our, um, in the, the text, if you walk through it, it actually starts in the center of the tabernacle, which is where the ark is, and then it goes out to the people. And that's really how the gospel accounts work also. They start with God, and they work out, and it ends at the cross. I'll come back to this again. But the way that we're going to look at it is the reverse. How do we take advantage of this in coming back into God's presence? So a few different points before we get started. Moses, number one in our account, a few things to highlight. Moses does take a free will collection at the beginning of our account for all the items that are needed to build this tabernacle. So it's all a free will offering from God's people that his dwelling is made. In fact, it says, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst, exactly as I show you concerning the patterns of the tabernacle and of all of its furniture, so you shall make it. The two builders of the tabernacle, God fills them with his spirit, his ability and intelligence to be able to make these exactly like how they're supposed to be made. 
And this section ends with a strict instruction for them to keep the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a sign of the covenant with God, the Mosaic covenant of rest and peace. And that's what God is moving towards, bringing us back to peace with God. It's supposed to be something that is identifying for who they are, but also it's a reminder as to the direction that they're moving in. The whole thing is to move us back into a place of peace with God. The very last sentence of our section says that God gave Moses the two tablets of the testimony, so the Ten Commandments is what we're, we're used to referring to it as, written with the finger of God. So on that note, the first section that we're going to look at is the priest. This character, represented in Aaron, who's Moses' brother, is a holy warrior. I, I think that's probably the best way to look at it. Um, is a person that is meant to be self-sacrificing, um, pure, a teacher, a mediator between God and humanity. It's not an easy role to take on at all. They were to teach the way of God, the importance of his word, to guide God's people into truth, protect them against deception, to teach them the difference between common and holy, how to live in God's blessings and not to fall into his wrath. Jesus absolutely did this for three years. He was the good shepherd. Willing to even be self-sacrificing for the good of the sheep, if necessary. That's exactly the way that this person is meant to be. They need to be in the image and likeness of God. Vitally important. They need to call out sin uh, if it's present. For healing. To bring them back. God's people back into his blessings. And this person also mediated between God and humanity through sacrifices for sin. Jesus does this with himself. He himself was lifted up as a sacrifice. Their clothes were meant for glory and for beauty, but also to remind the priest again of their identity and responsibility. The whole thing is just, is, is every bit of clothing on there had a purpose, had a reason to it, behind it. Um, on the top, is a, uh, on the top of the turban was a plate that said holy to Yahweh on his forehead to remind him. In Revelation 22, 4, it says, and this is the section where in the New Jerusalem, at the end of the Bible, it says that they, God's people, will see his face, see God's face. His name will be written on their foreheads. What that's implying is that everyone in the New Jerusalem, everyone will be priests. Every one of them will have God's name written on their forehead, holy and separate. Be meant, eventually we'll see, to be transferred into his image, to his likeness, and represent him. Onyx stones were put, one on each shoulder. There were six, there are 12 tribes in Israel, and six tribes were um, engraved on each shoulder to bear the weight of them. The breastplate of judgment was also 12 stones representing every one of the tribes. It said that he will bear judgment of Israel on his heart before the Lord regularly. Ooh, that's a big weight. Consecration. Actually, before I even get into that, in the book of Hebrews, you see Jesus is, is said to be... Um, high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek is a character in, in Genesis that what they're basically saying is, is that he is both king and priest. And that's not possible in the Hebrew law. You can't be king and priest. You can be one or the other, but not both. But Jesus is above even the law of God, of Moses. So therefore, even greater than Aaron, greater than Moses, not only for that, but also for the fact that he is eternal and that he has no sin either at the same point. The consecration of the, peace, of the priests, they had many sacrifices that not only purified them initially, but also even regularly from sin, because they were not sinless or eternal. So they needed to be washed from sin themselves. They were washed also by water regularly. They went through periods of separation from everyone else, 
just with God alone. They were anointed with oil, fellowship offerings, so they ate in the presence of God. And all of this must be done exactly the way that God instructed them. If not, they would die. I think that that would strike the fear of God in anyone. Be careful to do everything exactly like how I tell you to do it. In fact, there is a situation, an account in Leviticus 10, where Nadab and Abihu, which are Aaron's sons, something like this happened. Nadab and Abihu, it says, sons of Aaron, each took the censer and put fire in it and laid incense on it and offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord has said. Among those who are near me, I will be sanctified. And before all of the people, I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. That was a tough lesson, obviously, for Aaron. Not a good thing. He definitely got his attention, though. And that is meant to be something that gets all of our attention. That God wants, he gives us his rules, his laws, his all of that for us to pay attention to it. Because it is important. It's very important. And the closer that we come into presence with him, the more that that is important for us to listen to what he's saying. In the book of Hosea, in chapter 4, it shows, it, it exposes the danger if this person, if this priest is corrupt, if this priest is not pure, is not good, what does that mean for everyone else? I'll read through it really quickly here. Hear the word of the Lord, O children of Israel, for the Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. There is no faithfulness or steadfast love. These are qualities of God that they were meant to take on in his image and likeness. There is no faithfulness or steadfast love, no knowledge of God in the land. There is swearing, lying, murder, stealing, committing adultery. They break all the bounds. And bloodshed follows bloodshed. Therefore the land mourns, and all who dwell in it languish. And also the beasts of the field and the birds and the heavens and even the fish of the sea are all taken away. Yet no one can contend. No one, let no one accuse for with you is my contention, O priest. He says, it's the priest that has brought all of this upon everyone's head. You shall stumble by day, and the prophets also stumble with you by night, and I will destroy your creator, your mother, but basically those in the earth as far as they created you. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. And I reject you from being priest to me. And since you have forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. And the more they increase, the more they sin against me, and I will change their glory to shame. They feed on the sin of my people, and they are greedy for iniquity. And it shall be like people like priests. I will punish them for their ways and repay them for their deeds. Their very actions which you permit take away understanding. You see what's going on here? The bottom line is this, is when we have a priest that is not in the image of God, it corrupts everyone. I know some of you are here today because you know of people that look like priests or pastors, but they probably act more wicked even than those that aren't believers. They have the look, but they don't act that way. That is extremely destructive to everyone. God calls us to be believers in him, to follow him, to come into his likeness. The pastor, the priest, whoever it is that is in that spot is absolutely supposed to be the one that is leading the way. Not in unrighteousness, but righteousness. Increased proximity to God demands increased purity to serve him, to take on more of his likeness, so to reflect it to others. Think of the destruction which is possible when these people are corrupt in infecting others. Since Christ, we are all considered to be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation, individually. And considering that God is so specific and does not change his ways, how important do you believe that it is for us to be sanctified in Him? Sanctification is coming more into the likeness of Christ. 
being transformed into it. We'll come back to this because that's a big, big, big point. All right, the outer court. The tabernacle, first of all, the outer court um, is all in bronze. Everything, all the items of the outer court are in bronze. Um, the Levites, as you see here, which are the priests, were um, positioned all the way around all parts of, of the tabernacle. They were basically guards to make sure that no one could get in. There was only one entrance in to the tabernacle. This is the tabernacle here, the tent. There's one gate. There's a wall that went around, and all of the Levites were all the way around it guarding it. In fact, you even have Moses and Aaron's tent is right in front guarding the door as well. There are two items that are in uh, the courtyard. This is the outer of the courtyard, basically. You have the uh, bronze altar and then the uh, water basin, which is right here. This is the first thing that you see when coming into the uh, tabernacle. <laughs> These here are slaughtering tables for the sacrifices to put them on the altar. This is where sin is atoned for. It's the first thing that come into most important, first thing, sin is the problem, sin is the issue, this is where sin is dealt with, right here. Like we said last week, the wages of sin is death. That's what it is required, is that something needs to die in, in judgment for sin against God. Blood symbolizes that. There was blood everywhere around this thing. It was meant to be ugly. It was meant to, to really not be pretty at all. This is where Christ died on the cross, right here. Here's the water uh, basin. Again, another way of looking at it, you have the altar, you have the water. Most likely what these had looked like. Um, the water bowl was for washing, simply for the priests to wash their hands and their feet before going into the tabernacle. If not, again, it says, if you do not do this, you will die when entering into the tent. Mandatory for all generations, it says. And after being redeemed by Christ's blood, we also are washed clean of sin and dirt of this world. Purified. See, the purpose of God's people is to be purified from all sin and to come into his presence. So to be sanctified, to be made holy, to be made separate. Because God is going to be among them. He's going to dwell among them. And that sin needs to be dealt with. Otherwise... He will lash out against them. He is good. And there is no sin in him. In verse uh, 29, this is in our section, in our uh, chapters, there uh, it says, There I will meet with the people of Israel, meaning in the tabernacle, and it shall be sanctified by, by my glory. I will consecrate the tent of meeting and altar. Aaron also and his sons will consecrate, I will consecrate to serve me as priests. I will dwell among the people of Israel and be their God. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God who brought them out of the land of Egypt that I might dwell among them. I am their God, the Lord their God. Sin is like, it's like pouring gasoline on us. When we come too close to the fire, we're going to go up. It needs to be washed off. We need to be degassed, I guess you could say. We need to get that stuff off of us, to be cleansed of it. That's what the altar does. That's also what's symbolized in the water as well. All right, so the tabernacle. The tabernacle is all, everything in it is all gold. It's coming into the throne room of God. It's coming into his house, into his tent, living under his roof, basically, is what it comes down to. Um, also, the outer court has everything to do with justification. Justification is being made right with God. It's a legal term that there's a wrong that has been done and something needs to be justified. So therefore, that's where atonement is made. Reconciliation through the sacrifices, that's justification. And definitely an equivalent to what Christ did at the cross, that's justification. The tabernacle represents sanctification. Sanctification has everything to do with coming into the likeness of Christ, being transformed into his likeness, living with him in his presence. There are two parts to the tabernacle, the holy place and the holy of holies. 
Like I said, everything in here is gold. There's one entrance to the holy place, one entrance to the holy of holies. Um, you have the lampstand, which is here, the table of bread, which is here, and then the altar of incense, which is here. The lampstand um, is seven lamps on it. This is what it looks like right here. Symbolizing seven days of creation, symbolizing the light that came into the darkness in Genesis 1, the God of creation, the God of life, the God of light, all of it is indicated here. Psalm 119, verse 105 says, The word of God is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. It keeps me from stumbling, from falling into the pit, from falling into darkness. It guides us. Luke 11, 34 through 36, Jesus says, Your eye is the lamp of the body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light, but when it's bad, your body is full of darkness. Therefore, be careful lest the light in you be darkness. If your body is whole, is, if your whole body is full of light, having no part of it dark, it will be wholly bright. As when a lamp with its rays give you light. This is a whole idea. It's giving you a visual of transformation. Saying what you focus in on. What are you focusing in on? Is it God or is it more of the world? The world will bring you into darkness, guaranteed. That's what it is. It's fallen into sin. But what it is, is, is if your eye is good, if it's on God, if it's placed on that, if you are in his tent, focusing on that, having God's light, then it will transform you and turn you into light, holy light, having no darkness in you whatsoever. Olive oil was the fuel for this lamp. Olive oil is a sign of blessing, it signifies favor. It was also something that was used for anointing, showing chosen of God. Zechariah 4.2, there's two olive trees that feed the lamps, which symbolize God's enabling for Israel to recreate the temple once it was broken down in exile. And he says, not by, my, not by your power, but my, by my spirit will you do it. So it's also somewhat of a symbol for um, the spirit of God working within Revelation 21, 22 through 23 is talking about the New Jerusalem, and it says, I saw no temple in the city. I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. The Lamb is the sacrifice, the eternal sacrifice, which is Christ for us. So in saying the Lamb, that's Christ. And the city has no need for sun or moon to shine in it, for the glory of God gives its light. Its lamp is the Lamb. Its lamp is the Lamb. That's what it's indicating right there. Lampstand is symbolic for the tree of life. As you see, it looks somewhat like a tree. <coughs> tree of life. In Proverbs 3.18, Proverbs is, is talking about wisdom. That's what it all is. It's all about wisdom. And wisdom in the very beginning of it is personified. It's given a, 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 a personification. And it's, it's talked about as a female. She. It says, she is a tree of life to those who lay hold of her. Those who hold fast are called blessed. Proverbs 11.30 says, the fruit of righteousness is a tree of life. He who has an ear, in Revelation 2, 7, it says, Hear the Spirit, what the Spirit says to the churches, to the one who conquers, I will grant to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. The tree of life is only in God's presence. In the Garden of Eden, in the New Jerusalem at the end as well. In Revelation 22, 14, it says, Blessed are those who wash their robes. Hence, Washing their robes back here in this and also here. Both of these are washing. Washing in the blood of Christ, also washing as far as cleanse of all sin through the water. They have the right to the tree of life, that they may enter it by the city gates. And in Revelation 22, 19, if anyone takes away from the words of this book, of this prophecy, God will take away his tree, the share in the tree of life in the holy city, which is described in this book. That's pretty strong. <laughs> Respect the words of God. 
Don't take anything away from them because they are all truths. No matter how painful they are, just because we don't like it, doesn't allow us to be able to take away from it. He's saying it's there for a reason. Look at it. It's there for your healing, for good. All right, so the second item then is the table of bread. There are 12 loaves of bread that were listed on there as well as drink, and it represented the 12 tribes of Israel. It was a matter of presence as far as with fellowship, with eating, with sustenance also, like the manna on a daily basis, provisions for God. The word of God also was represented here, wisdom and fellowship again. In Psalm 23, I think everyone for the most part knows Psalm 23, wonderful psalm. The first part of it has to talk about the good shepherd. The second part of it talks about the table. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. That's the table. You anoint my head with oil. Oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall overflow, shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is the house of the Lord. Altar of incense. It's right here. There was only one day that blood was actually put on the horns of these altars, and that was on the Day of Atonement, where the priest um, atoned for all of Israel's sins as a majority overall. One day out of the year. Otherwise, it was just incense that was basically burned on it. And uh, the smoke was a visual reminder of the prayers that continually are going up before God that he hears, that he sees, and that he listens to and answers. By being in his house, they have communion with him. They can speak to him, and he answers their prayer. This is an insight into the, the, uh, this is the holy um, area, the front part. This is the veil. This is the, um, the holy of holies, and where the Ark of the Covenant basically is. You see the lamb table and the altar right here and the priest. This would be closed all the time. It's only open for us to see behind it. This veil, once they get into the land of Jerusalem, this veil in the temple, when Solomon makes a temple, the tabernacle is no longer mobile. It becomes a temple in a building that, that doesn't move, but it's the same structure, same kind of building with all the right same details. This veil is three inches thick. It said that even the strongest fleet of horses could not run in opposite directions and tear that thing in half. Yet after Christ was crucified, his death, that veil ripped from top to bottom all by itself. What that symbolized is that God, I know some people have said that God came out to the whole world. I don't believe that that's the case. I believe what it's saying is that God came out. There was no separation here from here. In his home, in his house, he came out and he is in our presence. He is with us all the time, but he's still in the house of God. But ripped that section right there wide open by what Christ did at the cross. There was no separation between man and God, mankind, humanity, men and women. The Holy of Holies, um, again, the altar or the uh, Ark of the Covenant is the greatest symbol of God's presence on earth. It was said to be the footstool of his, of his throne. If he's sitting in heaven, his, the Ark was where his feet were, less, where, were set. The cherubim that are listed on them, you can see them a little bit up there on the top. Um, you can also see them here. These were beings, I don't think it's really accurately um, a good representation of what they look like there, but because um, they had like four wings, they had four heads representative basically of creation, humanity being one of them. Um, pretty interesting beings. But they were angelic beings that you see the cherubim first after Genesis 3. When Adam and Eve sinned, they were thrown out of the garden. The cherubim were put there to guard them from going back in. Adam and Eve were meant to be the guardians of God's throne, of God's presence. And they blew it by eating the forbidden fruit and were thrown out. The cherubim seemed to step in and take over of that place. And hence, that is called the judgment seat or the mercy seat. Either way, that's where Moses met with God and where God spoke to Moses. But only Moses was able to go in there whenever he wanted, or when he was called, I should say, is the better way to put it. 
This whole area here is the house of God, like I said. The family benefits. Being able to come into his home. The benefits are light, being able to see, coming out of blindness, his word for guidance, food for drink and daily needs, fellowship, prayer, intimacy, God with joy and blessings and life. It's like a VIP backstage pass in the best kind. So, the last two concluding points here. One, Jesus is the living tabernacle. If you haven't gathered that already, some pointed out that the tabernacle actually shows us a cross. And I say the cross here because it's the only place that you have two items. You have the lamp and the bread that are right across from each other. Otherwise, there's a clear path going straight back to the ark and then across. It's there. I wouldn't call it a coincidence. John 14, 1, 14 says that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word dwelt means where it is tabernacled. When Christ was born, it says the word of God became flesh. It became a human. And what he says, what it's basically implying is when it says that it dwelt among us, it was tabernacled among us, saying that the word of God lived among us, walked among us, existed with us, went with us. And we have seen his glory as the Son of God, Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. Also in the book of John, there are the seven I am statements that we're going through right now in the Bible study. The first one is, I am the bread of life. Well, he is the bread of life. Notice how he starts here from the presence. He is God, so he's coming out and how he works his way right out the tabernacle. It says, when, Je when uh, then Jesus declared that I am the bread of life, he who comes to me will never go hungry, he who believes in me will never be thirsty. The second I am is I am the light of the world with the lamp. He said, I am the light of the world, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The third one is I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved, and he will come in and go out and find pasture. Four, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep, self-sacrificing. The good shepherd. The next two are, have to do with life. Now this one is brand new. There ain't nothing like this in the tabernacle. I'm the resurrection and the life. Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies. And whoever lives believes in me will never die. That's where, that's an indication back to Ezekiel 37, the valley of dry bones, where God says, speak to these bones and my spirit will come into them and they will live. I will bring life back into that which is dead. By my spirit, though. And that's exactly what this is talking about here. That's not in the tabernacle. That's extra ta tabernacle stuff. Six, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus answered that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Well, this is the only entrance. This is where Jesus allows us to come through. If he is the gate, the first place that we come to is the cross, that he purifies us of our sins. Next place is that we are purified because of that and given the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit even that comes upon us. He is the only door also, gate as far as here as well. He's the light. He's the bread. He also teaches us to be able to pray to God and that God answers us as his, as his children. And like we said, he's ripped open the veil so that we have communion with everything here. What God also calls us into, though, this time in here is meant to transform us. This whole time in here so that we would become more like back to what we were meant to be in God's presence, in his image, in his likeness. This is the guide that's meant to bring us through all of this. So often, unfortunately, even in Christianity today, this is where it stops. People leave it all to justification. 
Everything stops. It starts and stops at the cross. And the reason why we often say, why do I have a faith? It's, I'm supposed to have a victorious faith, but it's a faith that seems to be defeated all the time. It's because we stop out here. This priest is meant to direct us all the way through, all the way in to the tent of God, to dwell with Him in His midst. When we stop here, so often people are like, yeah, well, you know, God ended up, He, he made it so that He'll forgive us of all our sins. We can still live however we want to end up living, but we're good eternally. That's not the way that God directs us to. It never has been the case, ever. It's always been to take us all the way in this we cannot leave sanctification out of it. That is the one that was meant to bring us all the way through. And Jesus does that. And he shows us that. The importance of that. And the I am the vine is the greatest metaphor for the spiritual work in us. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, then he will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. We need to have the Spirit of God in us to be able to be transformed by God. We can't do it on our own. It's not possible. We have to embrace the whole process. That's where it starts. It's not where it ends, though. There's still a journey. There's still a journey beyond that. We don't just disappear up to heaven. There's still a journey. And that's what we need to understand. That's what Christ still says. He says there's still a story after that. The gospel might end there. But Acts then, God, or Jesus says, go and wait for my Holy Spirit. Do not go anywhere without it. You will need it. Jesus starts his ministry with the Holy Spirit as well. We must enter God's presence his way. That's important for us to remember. It's not our way. It's not the way we want it to be. Whatever, it's God's way. And he is very particular on everything that he is doing. He gives it to us in a very specific way for a specific purpose. Many times we have neglected the Old Testament, and because of that, we don't see the clear how clear this is. This is his blueprint for salvation. The issue of sin here, I think, is highlighted so great in Joshua is 7, 7 10 through 12. This is after they defeat, Israel comes into the promised land, they defeat Jericho, and then they lose to the next city, basically, that they end up coming against. I. And the Lord said to Joshua, Joshua's upset, he's down, he's sobbing, he's crying, he's like, what, what happened? We were supposed to defeat everybody. And the Lord said to Joshua, get up. Why have you fallen on your face? Israel has sinned. They have transgressed my covenant and I command, that I commanded them. They have taken the devoted things and they have stolen and lied and put them among their own belongings. Therefore, the people of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their backs before their enemies because they have become devoted to destruction. I will be with you no more unless you destroy the devoted things among you. It's all part of sanctification what it comes down to. After they do end up taking care of that, then they go through and they do, wait, nobody can overcome them. This is what Christ talks about, the whole thing. We need to understand the severity of sin, but also that God gives us the ability to overcome. Christ enables us to defeat sin eternally through justification, but also now through sanctification. When he says you have eternal life, that doesn't mean after you die. Eternal life starts now. You have access to the Holy Spirit. The presence of God dwells within and we will still have things that we have to battle, that we have to deal with. But he gives us the power to overcome, to work through. It is an issue of following and transformation. So, to remember the path, remember the journey, remember the salvation that is given to us uh, through the tabernacle as a blueprint. We must follow the full path of repentance and submission in order to have fellowship with God. This has been the, the, the point the whole, the whole time in the Bible, is how is he bringing the presence back into God? Would God leave us in a place after he does all that work and leave us just to fend for ourselves? He says in the book of John, I will not leave you as orphans. Because I live, you live. And he invites him. He says, let's go, let's do this. We've got work to do. God has a plan, but he invites us to go into it with him. The whole point is that we have fellowship in his house under his roof, with him, 
How do we do that? We need to embrace things like his word. We can't have fellowship if we're not embracing his word. We can't have fellowship if we're not embracing his spirit either at the same point. These are things that he gives to us in order to understand how can we be guided if we don't have any kind of game plans, any kind of plans, anything that's given to us. If you've ever been at a place where, I know I have, there was a point where God's word was pretty dead to me. I wasn't hearing anything. I'd read it and I'd be like, I don't get it. It's not doing anything for me. It's a decent story, but there's, I mean, come on, really? I mean, <laughs> no, uh, whatever. Can't be real. And then all of a sudden, when I did actually submit completely everything to me, and I said, God, you're God, not me anymore. And I died at the cross. Christ asks us, he commands us to follow him. We don't go up on the cross, but what we do is we're crucified to the flesh. And we follow him through in that way, cleansed, fed, led with the Spirit, embracing his word and his light and following him. And everything came alive, all of his word. Every bit of it went from one extreme all of a sudden to another, where it all just came alive. Every one of us, I'm nobody special. Everybody has access to that. Every single one of us. But we have to follow. Amen? Amen.